next we have uh, Sebastian, Troy, and Dan uh, uh, on the engineering panel, uh, uh, where we're going to discuss about how to build strong engineering orgs. So I'll invite them uh, into the stream. Uh, hey, Troy. Uh, hey, Dan. And hey, Sebastian. Hi. Hey, guys. Great. Uh, so uh, a quick intro. Uh, so Troy is a co-founder of Courier. They are into uh, API, uh, notifications API. And Dan is a VP of engineering at Replet. And uh, yeah, uh, and uh, we have Sebastian. He was a co-founder of Docker. And now he's a co-founder of OpsRace. Great. So uh, let's get right into it. Uh, to start with, one of the questions which I like, you know, uh, wanted to ask was, in the initial days, generally founders write, they say, the first lines of code or build the first, first versions of the product. At what point did you hire your first engineer or first couple of engineers? Probably, yeah, we can start with Sebastian. Sure. Yeah, we're, we're, we were very small when we started. Uh, as soon as we had a prototype, we started talking to our first outside engineers. Um, we wanted to have a good idea of what we were going to build. We wanted to make sure that this was going to be uh, something that we were committed to do for a while. And uh, once we had built this and once we had something that worked, uh, and it's different for everyone. I'm just talking about our story. Uh, for Upstrace itself, we got... Uh, somebody else involved. And I also remember in the early dot .cloud days, it, uh, we kind of uh, did the same things. We, we always got together with other people early together, uh, not just uh, uh, by ourselves, to kind of work with others and bring people on that kind of have this mindset of wanting to do new things uh, that are different. Um, that's not always possible, not always desired. This is just the route we did, and I like it. So I don't know how I would do it differently. Uh, so, yeah. Great. How about you, Troy? Um, yeah, look, I, I think one of the things worth noting is that all three of us are kind of in the same genre or industry, right, which is either dev tools or dev tools adjacent. And I think that that means you probably have to, we probably had to hire engineering earlier than, than some other companies, right? Uh, because like fundamentally the tools that we are building at Courier and at Replit and at OpsTrace are tools for engineers. And you, you kind of got to build enough that, that why, that's got to be like better than what they would just build themselves, right? In like a weekend. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of great, um, content from like, you know, Eric Ries and Lean Startup around, Hey, don't build stuff, right? Just like throw together some web forms and stuff. And like, I think that that's maybe like really good feedback for certain verticals, but for, Dev tools, like I, I don't think that you could really get away with that. Great. And Dan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm talking from Replit Legend, but um, there's some magic that comes from having a team of three to five people building for a long, long time. So for Replit, that team was Amjad, Haya, Ferris, and Turbio um, for a long, many, many, many years. It was just the, the four of them. Um, and a lot of great things came out of that. Great, yeah, uh, that's great to hear uh, all of your stories. So apart from, say, in the first founding engineers, apart from, say, the programming skills, what else do you look for? Uh, yeah. Sure. Who wants to go first? <laughs> uh, I'll, 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 I'll throw something in here. Um, you know, I, I, I found, like, those first few hires to be really challenging, not just in finding the right person, but, like, finding somebody who will agree to do it uh, is frankly pretty crazy, right? Like um, those first few hires, right? They're taking on a ton of risk. Uh, ideally, they're getting getting a nice uh, equity chunk, right? But like they're starting maybe months after the founders, right? Like they could probably go found something themselves, right? If they had the, the appetite for that. So, uh, so one of the things is just identifying what is the, um, you know, what are the parameters that you need to identify for somebody who's willing to do it, right? And uh, I found a few, like AngelList worked really well for me, I found, because in part because it was one of the few sites at the time that let me specify, you know, people looking for this size company, like that zero to 10, right? Triple Byte, for example, at the time didn't work well for me because a lot of the folks wanted to go to like a bang company. If you're like, if you have any interest in going to a bang company, you're probably not going to join a zero to 10. Like it's so like... So divergent. So I think that's a big part of it. It's just like who's crazy enough to even tr agree to do it, and then yeah. and then Absolutely. interview from there. And and often I find that 
just like for uh, finding a co-founder, it usually is like finding people that you've worked with before, uh, people that you know, like that, that will trust you to execute on something uh, or at least try out something with other people mm -hmm. versus uh, necessarily uh, just putting, it's very hard to just put a job posting out there. It's possible. Lots of people did it successfully. I know a lot that did it this way, but yeah. it's kind of... Uh, some you you want somebody who who wants to try something very new and i think uh, definitely mm -hmm. i've never seen somebody uh, come from like a fan company do it or something <laughs> but it exists i don't want to everything exists everywhere it, like, uh, it's a big switch it's a big switch uh, <laughs> in in developer tools um hiring from your community is also very powerful mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. we've had a lot of good luck whether contractors interns or full-time people people who really want to see the the product succeed and thrive um, and have a lot of opinions about it, um, they, they're, they'll be crazy enough to do it. Yeah. If you do something that's small enough that you can throw out very quickly and somebody like uh, that, mm -hmm. that gets a lot of attention, then it's different, right? Like lots of open yeah, source totally. uh, companies that started with something, uh, mm -hmm. they can attract very quickly as well. So it's yeah. really, there's not one thing that rules them all. Great. Yeah, uh, that's good to know. Like, you know, in the same lines, say, for example, the initial set of engineers are formed, like, you know, in the beginning, generally, there are not much process around, like, you know, just crappy, like writing code, pushing it, deploying it. So mm -hmm. what are some of the early processes which, like, you know, you put in place to, like, you know, build a good, good engineering team? Like, maybe you can start mm -hmm. with Dan. Yeah, I mean, what you said, is, like, you want to keep that as long as you can. <laughs> so that's what we're focused on really right now is we believe in strong ownership. Like engineers take something from design doc all the way out through shipping and, and blogging about it. Um, and we, we accept the chaos that, <laughs> that, that, that ensues um, or the small amount of chaos. Mm -hmm. uh, but really we're, when we're talking to people, it's, are you excited about the product? Are you excited about the mission? And do, can you, keep making progress even in the face of uncertainty. And that goes from the phone screen all the way through the on-site interview. People who move fast, even when it's not quite clear where they're headed or what the final product's gonna be, are gonna be great. Yeah. For sure. I, I've noticed that if you, even if you have the most interesting product in the world, if you build an engineering team and then you start shipping only every six months or worse every year, mm -hmm your team is going to dissolve and not be interested. Yeah. You need to ship constantly and fast. And that requires totally. a lot. To totally agree. Like there are a lot of like different failure states for engineering teams and engineering processes, but like kind of the only one that matters in the early days is not shipping fast enough, like to Sebastian's point. Right. So I would say like optimize everything possible around how do we, how do we re minimize the risk of not shipping fast enough? Right. And that's, like get the tooling and processes in place that make it like really easy to get to production, right? Like uh, continuous delivery, if at all possible, right? Where you commit to master, maybe somebody, you know, reviews a PR and boom, 10 minutes later, it's live in production. Also setting up like the, the cadence and like your process, you know, as you, as you grow a little bit bigger, like probably like the first three engineers, you don't need any process, but as you get even above that, you probably wanna have some minimal process. And I would even then optimize that process around like, Hey, what process will cause us to go faster? Great. Yeah. And you don't want to, you don't want to lose, you don't want to lose that, that momentum. Like it's, exactly. you, you can mm -hmm. keep saying like, oh, we're, we'll start, we'll, we'll just check this and we'll check this next time and we'll check that mm -hmm. and then before you know it, you're, you're triple checking and you're still making mistakes and moving slow. Yeah. So it's, you, you just have to keep going. It's better to check through code, and if you are, mm -hmm. if you have the luxury to start early, early on, you do a good testing infrastructure, a good monitoring infrastructure mm -hmm. that allows you to ship without, yeah. without even necessarily in the early days reviews, right? Like you have certain people that know, mm -hmm. and if it breaks, it breaks. Uh, that sounds bad in certain organizations, but in the beginning, it's not bad at all, at least to 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 me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so and it seems like you guys agree. Uh, but like, yeah. of course, you want to put gates in, but gates through code are 1000 times better than gates through process or people, because these yeah. are the ones that actually like can go fast. And we're lucky that we have technologies today that allow you to do this so much more than mm -hmm. it used to. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. On the, I, would, I would say like the gates should be through code and like the process, the human process should be more about like prioritization. 
Yeah. Right, and driving yeah, cadence and frequency. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. Uh, yeah, uh, and say the first few engineers generally like you know does many things like you know from full to like front and back and all these other things. Like at what point or like you know which uh, at which point do you bring in some kind of a team lead or like you know someone to take care of the team? Like you know is it the tenth engineer or fifteenth or like you know, what is that? Like, yeah. I heard I heard some good advice, which is at eight engineers you stop being able to direct traffic. That doesn't mean you you hire somebody at that point, but you you're going to need to really start delegating that that direction setting, um, and yeah, and and hiring people who are going to keep moving forward even under uncertainty helps a lot there. You can you can squeeze that team a lot farther. Yeah, yeah, it really depends on who you hire, honestly. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule. Uh, like uh, I, like uh, I remember, I've I've only joined organizations that started with management much much later. When I was at Cloudflare, mm -hmm. there was, mm, it's, yeah, it's much 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 later. And that usually yeah. I prefer, but that's again my preference. Uh, uh, but it's important to have some way of working together yeah. and coordinating, of course. Yeah, I would agree with Dan, like that eight person team is, is like starts to become kind of like the rough max of like what what really a single team with a shared single identity can can be. And then you start to have to look at like a hub and spoke model, right? And I don't think to Sebastian's point, you necessarily need a manager right away. Um, you know, if you, you could break up and have teams of, you know, three teams of three, right? And they could each have kind of their own processes, as long as you do have somebody on each of those teams who's might not be a manager but is self-motivated i guess and has some organizational skills and communication skills that can kind of help make sure that it continues forward. yeah, yeah. and yeah also you need to start, no, so go, go ahead, for sorry. it go for it sebastian no i was just going to say uh, uh, one thing that i wanted to add like we're talking about engineering organizations and if you're a young startup where you're going to branch out first it's not probably management for organiz for engineering but other functions other ideas that you've been doing or other people that it wasn't their job to do we were talking mm -hmm. about these first few crucial engineers that you hire that do things mm -hmm. that are not in their job description technically well at mm -hmm. some point you want to specialize certain functions so these happen to my opinion my, like i've seen this happen way before management layer yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. great yeah dan you have something to add no, I was gonna say you just you just need somebody to herd the cats. <laughs> they don't have to have manager in the title, um, and they can be a cat themselves. But <laughs> Love it. yeah, so eight is a magic number. Uh, anyways, uh, so yeah, in terms of like you know, as founders, uh, how has your role changed over the course of time? Like, do you still contribute to code base? How much do you do? And like you know, how are you involved day to day in engineering decisions? Yeah, hmm. maybe you can start with Troy. Sure. Um, so look, we're about two years old and I really don't ever contribute to the code base now. Um, so I would say that like the first three months, it was like, I was just a programmer. <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> build, 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 get the MVP. And then like the, the drop off from there was like pretty precipitous. Right. Um, so as the CEO of the company, right, it was all of a sudden like, okay, now like talking to investors and talking to customers and, um, as we grew, like I primarily hired engineers for like the first, you know, quite a few hires. And so I kind of just shouldered everything else. And so, um, I would say by like month six, less than half of my time was engineering. And then by the end of like year one, it was like a negligible amount. Every now and then I'll hop into like a side project or like a open source repo or like, you know, committing to our website, but like the core backend stuff, I'm, I'm not making commits to anymore. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to what Troy has to say, except that for me, it took me quite a bit of time to uh, to get rid of like, to to say, I'm going to stop focusing on how we build things and how these things are connected mm -hmm. from a high level. I love it. And even I love mm -hmm. the intricacies of them, but like, I'm not, I, I, I try to reserve. I used to constantly say, oh yeah, we should do it like this or like this. I stopped that. Yeah. Like, uh, and I hope that uh, my engineering team can tell me, yeah, he stopped telling us how to do things. <laughs> Uh, because I think it's good. I think uh, you like that's why you have other people, and uh, you need to focus on other things. Uh, and these, it comes 
like 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 Troy said, it comes fast and maybe earlier than you think. Uh, yeah. Got it. Done. Yeah, no, we've got a bias towards people being hands on um, at, at all levels at Replit. So um, when, when when I started, I was I was deep in it for many, many, many months. Um, and then it was a much more gradual phasing out for me. Um, and Amjad, the, the founder was uh, co-founder was was deep in it for a long, long time until he, he had to say, OK, if I have to touch the code, we've we've screwed up somewhere. <laughs> Somebody, somebody's not watching something um, and, and he, he, he had to say that because people people love to build they, they just love to build yeah by the way i have to add that it helps to have very technical co-founders and teams right it's not always the same sometimes the ceo mm -hmm. is the technical person sometimes yeah. multiple people are the technical person uh yep. so yeah uh, so to each their own got it great uh yeah uh that's that's great and there's this thing on like you know move fast and break things nowadays it's more about move fast with stability so what kind of like you know process do you uh, or what kind of things do you put in place to ensure say code quality uh, yeah testing lots of testing we talked about the gates yeah. right like uh, that's <laughs> one thing that we're obsessive about at our like we're building an open source project and we want to make sure that it constantly works so uh, we we try to make sure we test everything uh, we release often uh, a lot of it doesn't matter if you build a, pro a SaaS or something else if you whatever if you release all the time i think things will be safer you think it's not it you break things if you don't release all the time in my opinion mm -hmm. like the smaller the releases the more tests the yeah. better the monitoring and got these things the less problems you're going to have so it's not it's move fast and break small things that's it i'll leave it there <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would. I would, my our motto is move fast and pay attention. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That's it's it's yeah, uh, and and you don't pay attention when you're um when you're when you're shipping infrequently, but if you're if you're constantly deploying, it's it's just part of your life, um, totally. really. And 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 having a good post mortem process for the incidents that do happen is mm -hmm. is really worth it. That's where you you learn so much, um, and you you get better. You get a lot better. Great. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, yeah. The only thing I would add on. here is, yeah. is again, this is another thing that I think depends a little bit on your vertical or like the specific thing that you're implementing, right? Like, I think that there are some apps or products that you could build where I would probably say you probably should just move fast and break things, right? And I think like the social space, the productivity tool space might still that might still be the thing we want to do um because like the impact of breaking it is is maybe smaller than like certainly ops trace and courier are both like 24 7 live like being sent messages you know like programmatically like not by a human like a human is not the one uh constantly doing the thing and so if you break that you could have millions and millions of failures without like anyone no one's able to like say oh i'm just gonna stop doing that i'll come back to it later so I think you have to balance it based upon like how is your product actually used. Great, uh, yeah, uh, great. And one other thing is like you know, as and when teams grow. With what I've seen is uh, like you know when you after your engineering team, you have marketing team and sales team. Like you know, in general, the communication is is not really like you know much. Like you know, engineers kind of like you know do their own job and like you know they don't really talk to each other much. So, what 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 do you think you like you you have done to probably increase this uh, between teams? Maybe you can start with them. Yeah. Encouraging people to talk to each other. Yeah, uh, between teams, uh, between say, marketing and engineering, or sales and engineering. Yes, I mean the the big secret is to stay as small as you can as long as you can. But after after you cross that point, um, yeah, I've. I found my role more and more is to is to just let people know. Oh, hey, so and so is thinking of building this when I'm when I'm talking to business or marketing, um, and mm -hmm. and just just gently nudge people together. Um, it works wonders, um, and yeah, it, it's as straightforward as that. I mean, in our case, we're not at that stage at all. So, uh, like, uh, I've only done it at other people's companies, and uh, like, there's there's many thing there's many different ways to do it. But it's not keep keep an honest, open communication, right? Like, uh, uh, line between people, and like, remember that everybody's human. That's it. 
Yeah, I would I would say like it starts with transparency first, right? Like my my interest, if I'm an engineer, my interest in like what's going on in sales and marketing is going to first be like being able to see and check out what's going on. And then being able to like engage is like a next level of engagement. So if you don't have the transparency in place, it's really hard to get that engagement. So first, like make it really, really transparent so that if somebody's just curious or interested, it's easy for them to get that information without having to have like a Salesforce account or whatever it is, right? So they can get that. And then um, just find like ways to incentivize things. We, like we do silly stuff in Slack. Like we, we, use this, we just rolled out recently this app called Hey Taco where people can like award people tacos for, you know, hey, thanks for hopping on this customer call with me or, you know, things like that where it kind of incentivize social incentives for for having that collaboration across the organization. Are they real tacos? So they are digital tacos, <laughs> but uh, they're you can cash them in for real things, which may include tacos okay. or silver right. on the what what you can cash okay. them in for. All right. Great. I think uh, we got some yeah. questions from the audience here. Yep, uh, I think let's let's do the first one. How do you uh, how do you keep early engineers that joined before it was a little startup as a company grows and the process becomes heavier? Yeah, I think that's that's a that's an individual journey for each engineer, and you've got to talk to them and see what they're happiest and where they want to end up. I've I've got folks who've been there from the beginning, who just want to be in a very creative role. And I, I just, go for it. Go build the future for us. Um, we'll catch up. Um, other people want to make sure that the service is running. Um, I'm like, OK, OK, you can take your, take your time here. Um, but it's a it's a one on one conversation because, yeah, the, it's essentially a new company after a certain period of time. And you've got to you've got to um, re recruit them. <laughs> to yeah. to the new company that you have on your hands. That's a good point. That's a very yeah. good way of putting it. Like everybody's different. It's everybody changes. Uh, the companies change, and so mm -hmm. this happens all the time. Whether companies grow fast or not, like uh, you 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 have to mm -hmm. talk with your people and decide: uh, is this still something that you want to do or not? And everybody goes through this, and it's totally normal. And not everybody is for every all the phases. Uh, I've done I myself in different companies. I've only done certain phases, and it's fine. Like, uh, yeah. uh, like as long as you have fun and you know what, and both sides know what they want, and things are clear and open. Uh, it's it's better to talk about these things than to like shove them under a rug because and totally. think that everything's gonna always be perfect. Uh, no. Yeah. The the only thing I would add is is this question specifically highlights that like as the processes become heavier, and so I would say like. One thing you can do is delay the processes becoming heavy for as long as you can, right? Because there's um, not just retention. Retention isn't the only thing impacted by that. Uh, so figure out how to keep that process light and keep momentum high. And you'll still have challenges, though, as you grow with, with the retention. Like, I, I really like the way you said it, Dan. Like, that's a really good way of, of looking at it. Got it. Great. We have a couple more questions. One is, how do you keep the productivity of remote teams consistent? Depends like if you're I, only a remote team or if you have to remote teams and local teams. And also the pandemic changed everything. So, <laughs> Right. So uh, let's, yeah. let's assume like it's full, full remote teams. Like, you know, how do you we're, keep it? Yeah. yeah. We're, f we're full remote, but we're tiny. So on our end, uh, that's how we do it. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, so we're small and uh, we're all like, we know what we're building and uh, uh, we ship fast, we ship a lot. Everything we said in the beginning applies still. Ship yeah. often, build something all the time, uh, do something interesting. Uh, that's how. And, and right now, I don't have more to say because we're just engineers building a lot of stuff. Yeah, like I would, I would, I would agree shipping like it's it's a broken record right but like shipping early shipping often is is the key here right it's the it's it comes down to your cadence the faster you can deliver like the 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 faster you can respond to if there are problems right like if there isn't if productivity isn't where it needs to be then there's a reason why and right whether that come down to like a technology issue right like a gap in your deployment infrastructure or your testing infrastructure or whether it be a process issue or whether it be a personnel issue the faster, like the, the smaller the increment, the less off you can be, right? So like if you're setting up, like we do weekly cycles where we expect to deliver, like every engineer to deliver customer value every single week. 
right? Some people go even faster than that. Imagine you do monthly or quarterly cycles, right? If you're 10% off or 30% off, you could be off by way more than if you're that percentage off over the course of a week. So yeah. like condense your cycles and you will be able to identify those productivity issues faster, fix them, and they will have a lower impact when they do arise. And also the things on which the engineers are working on adjusts and they can they can mm -hmm. shift things if they don't like what they're doing, right? Instead of mm -hmm. being stuck in a project for six months, which drives yeah, everyone totally. insane. The manager totally. and the engineer, everyone. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we've had to make it really okay to, to talk to people. We've got a lunch roulette bot. So you're talking to random people mm -hmm. for lunch on Thursdays. Um, and mm -hmm. we've, we've got various tools we've built to make it really easy to pop into a meeting and um, just, you've, you've got to push on that communication because otherwise everyone will just sort mm -hmm. of go off into their corner. Um, That's it. true. That's true. You have to push uh, at all sizes, I think. <laughs> Great. So I think let's take one last question and we can wrap it up. Uh, as an employee, what kind of culture should you look for for a resilient org? Or what do you look for? Yeah. Uh, if I were if I were to go get an engineering job right now, um, I would I would look for places that are doing all the things we said, shipping off. And I would also ask um, what their what their postmortem process looks like. What happens when things go wrong? Do you mm -hmm. learn from it, or do you do you cry about it or yell about it? Um, that's those those are the two things I would look for. Yeah, yeah, I would, I, I would, um, oh, go, go ahead, so much. Oh no, okay, I can. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, I uh, I would say uh, I'll give an example for another type of job. Imagine you're uh, another engineering job in SRE. Then I would uh, since I would ask about how the on-call rotations work and the monitoring <laughs> process and everything. Not speak. I wouldn't necessarily run away. It was bad, but I would want to ask. Okay, can we? Can I fix it? Can I actually? Are you open? Like, if it's if it's small, it'll be easy to fix. If it's a good big org, probably uh, harder, of course. But like, that's otherwise will drive you insane. Like, yeah. um, one thing I would add is, um, you know, for a lot of us that are like working in tech, working in venture backed tech, like we maybe take it as a given, but for like. The majority of software engineering jobs are for companies whose product, whose primary business model is not s selling software, right? And probably the easiest thing you can do to like have a better engineering culture is work for a company whose primary business is building and delivering software. So if that's an option for you, if you're looking between two companies, like, like there's a bunch of stuff you have to do well after that, right? But the incentives are so much better aligned for a company who like software is the thing for them, right? Uh, than if it's a like cost center to help enable this other business line that, that they uh, are act the thing they actually care about. Got it. Thank you. Uh, perfect. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much, Troy, Dan, and Sebastian. Like it was really great. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you Thanks all. for having us. Yep. Cheers, guys.